Jersey, recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, for all of the benefits that Facebook has provided in building communities and connecting families, uh, I think a devil's bargain has been struck. And uh, in the end, Americans do not like to be manipulated. They do not like to be spied on. We don't like it when someone is outside of our home watching. We don't like it when someone is following us around the neighborhood or even worse, following our kids or stalking our children. Uh, Facebook now has evolved to a place where you are tracking everyone. Uh, you are collecting data on just about everybody. Uh, yes, we understand the Facebook users that, that uh, proactively sign in are in part of that, that platform. But you're following Facebook users even after they log off of that platform and application. And you are collecting personal information on people who do not even have Facebook accounts. Isn't that right? Congresswoman, I believe that Yes we, or no? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I'm not sure. That, I don't think that that's what we're tracking. No, uh, you're collecting. Uh, you have already acknowledged that you are doing that for security purposes and commercial purposes. So you are, you're collecting data outside of Facebook. When someone goes to a website and it has the Facebook uh, like or share, that data is being collected by Facebook, correct? Uh, Congresswoman. Yes or no? That's right, that we that we understand in order to show which of your friends yeah, so for people that like don't even pay. have Facebook I don't think that the average American really understands that today something that fundamental and that you're tracking tracking everyone's online activities uh, their searches you can track what people buy correct uh, congressman a uh, congresswoman uh, you're collecting I, that data what people purchase uh, online I, yes I, I no? actually if they share it with us. But Congress because it has overall, a share I, I, button, so it's, it's, it's gathering. Facebook has the application. In fact, you patented applications to do just that. Isn't that correct? To collect that data. I don't think any of those buttons share transaction data. But broadly, but I, they, I they track with you. the you want You're collecting medical data, correct, on, on people that, that are on the Internet, whether they're Facebook users or not, right? Congresswoman, yes, we collect some data for And you're collecting, and uh, you watch where we go. Senator Durbin had a, had a funny question yesterday about where you're staying, and you didn't want to share that. But you, Facebook also gathers that data about where we travel. Isn't that correct? Congresswoman, everyone has control over how that works. I'm going to get to that. But yes, you are. Would you just acknowledge that, yes, Facebook is, that's the business you're in, gathering data and aggregating that data? Congresswoman, I disagree with that characterization. You are not. Are you saying you do not gather data on on where people travel based upon their internet and the the ways they sign in and things like that? Congresswoman, the primary way that Facebook works is that people choose to share data, and they share. Primary way, but but the other way that Facebook uh, gathers data is you buy data from data brokers outside of the platform, correct? Congresswoman, we just announced two weeks ago uh, that we were going to stop interacting with data brokers, and w even though that's an industry norm to make it so that the advertising can be more. But relevant. I think in the end, I think what see it's it's practically impossible these days to remain untracked in America for all the benefits Facebook has brought and and the internet, and that's not part of the bargain. Uh, and current laws have not evolved, and the Congress has not adopted. Uh, laws to, ad to address digital surveillance, and Congress should act. And I do not believe that the controls, the opaque agreement, uh, consent agreements, the settings are an adequate substitute for fundamental privacy protections for consumers. Now, General, some... General Lee's time. Thank you. I yield back my time. General Lee's time. Let that stand. And I'd like to ask unanimous consent that I put my constituents' questions in the record. For... Without objection. Thank you. Chair now recognizes gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, for... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thanks for being here. Uh, when I first got into public office, the Internet was really kicking off, and I had a lot of people complain about ads, just the inconvenience of ads, trying to get the, in the cumbersome of the Internet. I remember telling someone one time, being from Kentucky, a basketball fan, 
I said, there's nothing I hate worse than the four minute timeout, the TV timeout, it's flow of the game and everything. But because of the four minute timeout, I get to watch the game for free. So that's something I'm willing to accept to move for free. What you're not re really willing to accept is that your data is just out there and it, it's being used. But it's been used in, in the right way, and, and it's funny because I was going to ask this question anyway. My, my friend, I was planning a family trip to Florida, and I searched uh, a town in Florida, and all of a sudden I started getting ads for a brand of hotel that I typically stay in at a great hotel at the price if available to the public because it was on the Internet that I was willing to pay and stay there. And so I thought it was actually convenient. Instead of getting just an ad to some place I'll never go, I got an ad specifically to a place I was, I was looking to go, so I thought that was convenient. And it wasn't Facebook, uh, although my wife used Facebook to message my mother-in-law this weekend for when we were meeting up, so it's very valuable. We get to do that for free because your business model relies on consumer-driven data. This wasn't Facebook, it was a search engine, but they used consumer-driven consumer data to target an ad to me. So you're not unique in Silicon Valley or in this internet world in doing this type of targeted ads, are you? No, Congressman, you're, you're right. I mean, this is ad-based business models have been a common way that uh, people have been able to offer free services for a long time. And our social mission of trying to help connect everyone in the world relies on having a service that can be affordable for everyone, that everyone can use. And that's why the ads business model is in service of the social mission that we have. And you know, I think sometimes um, that gets lost, but I think that's a really important point. But, but you're different in that instead of getting just a bro the when I'm watching the, the Hilltoppers on basketball, the person advertising me doesn't know anything about me. I'm just watching the ad, so there's no data, no agreement, or no uh, risk, I guess, there. But with you, there there is consumer-driven data. But if we were to greatly reduce or stop or just greatly reduce through legislation the use of consumer-driven data for targeting ads, what do you think that would do to the internet? Just and when I say internet, I mean everything, not just Facebook. Well, Congressman, it would make the ads less relevant. So, so well, if we had less revenue, what would that do to and, them? Yeah, it, it would reduce, it, it would have a number of effects. For people using the services, it would make the ads less relevant to them. For businesses, like the small businesses that use advertising, it would make advertising more expensive because now they would have to reach, they would have to pay more to reach more people inefficiently um, because targeting helps small businesses be able to um, afford and, and, reach, and reach people as effectively as big companies have typically had the ability to do for a long time. It would affect our revenue some amount too, but I think one, there are a couple of points here that are lost. One is that we already give people the control to not use that data in ads if they want. Most people don't do that. I think part of the reason for that is that um, people get that if they are going to see ads that they want them to be relevant. But the other thing is that our, a lot of what our business, uh, what makes the ads work, um, or what makes the business good is just that people are very engaged with Facebook. We have more than a billion people who spend um, almost an hour a day across all our services. Yeah, I have 30 seconds, so I appreciate the answer to that. But if so, so. I didn't opt out, I, so forth, and all of a sudden I said, you know, this just doesn't work for me, so I want to delete. You told uh, Congressman Rush that you could delete. What happens to the data? I've already, it's there, it's been used, it's, Cambridge Analytics may have it. So what happens when I say, Facebook, take my data off your platform? If you delete your account, we immediately make it so that your account is, um, is no longer available once you're, once you're done deleting it. Um, so no one can find you on the service we wouldn't be able to recreate your account from that. We do have data centers and systems that are redundant and we have backups in case something bad happens. And over a number of days, uh, we'll, we'll go through and, and make sure that we flush all the content out of the system. But as soon as you delete your account, uh, effectively that content is um, is dismantled, and we wouldn't be able to put your account back together if we wanted. Gentlemen's time. Well, thank you, my time is I appreciate it. Recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Mr. Zuckerberg. I wanted to get something in the record quickly before I move to some questions. You had suggested in your testimony over the last couple of days that Facebook notified the Trump and Clinton campaigns of Russian attempts to hack in uh, to those campaigns, but representatives of both campaigns in the last 24 hours have said that didn't happen. So 
we're going to need to follow up on that and find out what the real um, story is. Do but, you want me to? No, I'd like I'd like to move on. You can provide a response to that um, in writing if you would. Let me ask you: Is it true that Facebook offered to provide what I guess you refer to as dedicated campaign embeds to both of the presidential campaigns, Congressman? I can quickly respond to the first point, too. Just say, the, yes the, or no, the, were, were there the, the, embeds? I need so to get I, to I, that because I, I don't have time. Were there embeds in the two campaigns? Were offers of embeds? Congressman, yes we, or no? We, we, were, there, were there embeds offered to the Trump campaign and the Clinton campaign? We offer sales support to every campaign. Okay, so sales support, I'm going to refer to that as embeds and I gather that Mr. Trump's campaign ultimately accepted that offer. Is that correct? Yes or no? The, 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 the Trump campaign had sales support. And okay, the so they had, had embeds. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer to those as embeds. What I'd like you to do if you could, we're not going to have time for you to do this now, but if you could provide to the committee um, both the initial offer terms and then any subsequent offer terms um, that were presented to each candidate in terms of what the embed services would be, that would be very helpful. Um, do you know how many ads were approved for display on Facebook for each of the presidential candidates by Facebook? Congressman, I do not, sitting here off the top of my head. Okay, let I me tell you what they were, because I do. Um, President Trump's campaign had an estimated 5.9 million ads approved, and Secretary Clinton 66,000 ads, so that's a delta of about 90 times as much on the Trump campaign, which raises some questions about whether the ad approval processes were maybe not um, processed correctly or inappropriately bypassed in the final months and weeks of the election by the Trump campaign. And what I'm worried about is that the embeds may have helped um, to facilitate that. Can you say with absolute certainty that Facebook or any of the Facebook employees working as campaign embeds did not grant any special approval rights to the Trump campaign to allow them to upload a very large number of Facebook ads in that final stretch. Congressman, we apply the same standard to all campaigns. Can you say that there were not special approval rights granted? Is that what you're saying? There were not special approval rights granted by any of the embeds or support folks, as you call them, in that Trump campaign? Congressman, yes no? what I'm, yes, what I'm saying is okay. that you All right, if you're saying yes, if you're saying yes, then I'll, I'll take you um, at your word. The reason this is important and the reason we need to get to the bottom of it is because um, it could be a serious problem if these kinds of services were provided beyond what is offered in the normal course, because that could result in violation of campaign finance law, because it would be construed as an in-kind contribution, corporate contribution from Facebook beyond what the, the sort of ad buy opportunity would typically um, provide. The reason I'm asking you these questions is because I'm worried that that embed program has the potential to become a tool for Facebook to solicit, solicit favor from policymakers, and that then creates the potential for real um, conflict of interest. And I think a lot of Americans are waking up to the fact that Facebook is becoming sort of a self-regulated superstructure for political discourse. And the question is, are we, the people, going to regulate our political dialogue? Or are you, Mark Zuckerberg, going to end up regulating the political discourse? Gentlemen's so we need to be time. free of that undue influence. Um, I thank you for being here. Gentlemen's time. I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas.